We want to thank you for the opportunity today to remember those who have died and those who have served in war. We especially remember those known to members of this church family today. Harold Herbert Brooks, uncle to Ed Alexander. George Beckman, father to Glynis Baker. Joseph Turnbull, father to Daphne Morrow. William Morrow, grandfather to Gordon Morrow. William Wilby, great uncle to Ruth Pratt and Mary Cousins. Herbert Armstrong, father to Roger Armstrong. And another Herbert Armstrong, granddad to Roger Armstrong. Donald John Leftley, Jen Sheehan's father's cousin, and Arthur Charles Kendrick, first cousin to Paul Kendrick. Together with more than 4,000 people who have died from Ipswich and 207 former pupils at Northgate High School. We thank you, Father, for their willingness to serve and to sacrifice so much for the sake of others. We ask for your comfort for those who mourn today, for those missing a loved one, or for those missing a fellow comrade. We pray for those who have survived war, especially for those left traumatized or with life-changing injury. We pray for their healing, and we pray for their ongoing care. We pray for those who continue to serve on the front line and for those missing loved ones, mums and dads, daughters and sons, for those who are far away from the security of their home. We too remember those countries currently torn apart by war, including Israel, Gaza, Lebanon, Iran, Ukraine, Russia and Bolivia. We pray for the innocent, for the orphaned and the misplaced, as we also pray for your peace, Father God. Give wisdom to those serving in military and political leadership and strengthen the work of your people, Father, as they seek to bring your light amid the darkness. We ask for your forgiveness when at the center of war there has been unrighteousness and injustice. And we thank you. We thank you, Father, for the promise of everlasting life in Christ Jesus. For the day when wars will cease, when there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, We pray, Father, for the realization of your kingdom today as we declare together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone, for respecting that time of remembrance and the silence. Thank you to all of you who have given names to me in the last week or brought photographs and stories. There are some incredible stories here, and I really encourage you, before you leave today, to come and take a look at those photographs. Perhaps you want to talk to some of the people involved. Thank you, Olive, to you as well for putting a lovely floral display together for us. Why don't we thank Olive? Great job. And I will hand over to Ruth, who's going to lead us with the rest of the team in worship. Thanks, Ruth. Andy, um, as we've looked back with sorrow uh, and pain over the things that we've remembered, things that can hurt, 
we also can look forward with hope because of what Jesus has done. So we're going to sing a couple of songs now that remind us that as painful as the past may be, our future is filled with hope in Jesus. If you're able to, do stand as we sing these two hymns together. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when strife my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in heaven. God, thank you for your promise that your mercies are new every morning. Thank you that however troubled and painful and grief-stricken our past, or our present, we have a hope in you. If not in this world, not in this life, then the promise of the next. Thank you that you didn't leave this down to chance or our own effort, but that you sent Jesus to make sure that we could be healed and redeemed and have a way back to you. Thank you that this morning we come to worship the Prince of Peace. 
Amen. Sing again. take your seats uh, unless you're expecting to go out oh unless unless you're Andy in which case I'm going to come and give us some news uh, unless you are in key stage one or key stage two in which case can you follow key stage two follow Anna out of this door and key stage one and reception Sue and Lizzie we'd love for you to go out of this door and if you're confused and don't know where to go find someone in a red t-shirt that says team and they will guide you to the right place <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, morning, everybody, once again. 
Uh, my name's Andy. I'm one of the ministers here. Jerry's away uh, this weekend. He'll also be on conference for the next couple of days. Um, so if you can't get hold of him, feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, I'll be happy to do what I can to serve you. Some news this morning, and I don't know if you've heard, but Christmas is coming. I was interested to gauge the reaction to that. My oldest daughter decided to start listening to Christmas music about two weeks ago. Um, so we're in a world of pain right now. We're in a world of pain. <laughs> um, well, one of the, the services that we'll be hosting this year at Christmas is a new one for us actually called Love for Life, Love for Life Carols. And this will take place actually the day before Advent begins on the 30th of November. And this is an intentional opportunity for anyone who comes to remember those they will miss at Christmas. I mean, Christmas um, for, for many is a difficult time because you miss the people that you love so much and who are no longer with us. And so we're creating a space this year to remember those individuals, to, to pray and to give thanks to God for them, to pray for ourselves that we might know the Father's comfort and love. So we would love to invite you to that on the 30th of November. It's at four o'clock in the afternoon and there'll be some refreshments served afterwards. Do invite friends and family, anyone you think this service would be relevant for. We're, we're sending invitations out kind of far and wide to hospices and hospitals and funeral directors. So do invite those you know who might appreciate this space. We would love to be able to serve them. So that's on the 30th of November. If you're a church member, uh, on Wednesday the 20th of November there is a members meeting. I know, at 7.30 p.m., so do keep that in your diary. Shoeboxes, if you have been preparing lovingly a shoebox for Operation Christmas Child and Samaritan's Purse, those shoeboxes begin to uh, get collected, I think tomorrow, is that right, Roger? Yeah, and throughout this week, uh, the deadline is next Sunday. So if you haven't done it during the week, bring your shoebox next Sunday and we will pray and give thanks to God and send uh, the parcels away with his blessing. Next Saturday, that's the 16th of November, we have the Tear Fun Big Quiz Night. Hey, who's coming? I think there'll be more people than that. Um, I know there are more people than that coming. We'd love you to come along, 7.30 p.m. If you could sign up, that would really help us because last year we had a bit of a table crisis. I know, who would think? Um, there weren't enough tables for the number of people that were there. So if you're able to sign up for us, that would be really helpful just to make sure we've got enough resources. Even if you sign up for your whole team, that will just give us an idea and you can write a note on your booking to say, I'm booking for eight people or 20 people, however big your team will be. Um, you can sign up by Church Suite or on our website, crbc.org.uk. We look forward to seeing you there. Next Sunday, there is a baptism. Actually, there are two baptisms. Hey, uh, at the praise evening, which is at seven o'clock in the evening. So do come along to that if you can to support the candidates and to worship Jesus with us. And finally, a question for you. What is so valuable to you that you do it five days a week? Hmm, I wonder. I'll leave it there and I'll hand over to Ruth once more. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> Mystery. Let's go upstairs. You're welcome. Um, and I'm going to carry on um, with this morning's service by reading a few words of scripture. Um, they're words from Lamentations, uh, and if you've read the whole book, you'll know that a lot of it is very solemn uh, and very sad. Somebody in distress writing about their suffering. But right in the middle, there's this burst of hope. It says in chapter 3, Then I remember something that fills me with hope. The Lord's kindness never fails. If he had not been merciful, we would have been destroyed. But the Lord can always be trusted to show mercy each morning. Deep in my heart, I say the Lord is all I need. I can depend on him. So if you're able to, we're going to stand and sing a couple of uh, hymns that reflect on those words. The Lord is all I need. I can depend on him. From him, our forgiveness comes. From him, our hope comes. Let's sing together.
How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure
teach my songs to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. And Jesus, you're my hope and stay. So teach my song to rise. we come to you this morning with generations of others and say we need you so bless us now teach us now as we listen to your word together in Jesus name amen please take your seats thank you so much team that's great well, we're going to uh, continue our series, Encountering Jesus, and we're going to turn to uh, Luke's gospel today. So if you have a Bible with you, you want to turn with me to Luke 23, and we're going to read verses 32 to 43 together. Luke 23, 32 to 43. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him, that's Jesus, to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the anointed one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's a beautiful passage of scripture, isn't it? And it seemed to me to be a fitting passage of scripture to read on Remembrance Sunday. It surely got to be one of the most powerful, the most powerful encounters of Jesus in the New Testament. Don't you think? An incredibly powerful encounter. Yet, as well as being one of the most powerful encounters, it's probably one of the most challenging encounters of Jesus in Scripture too. Why? Well, because it raises so many questions. <laughs> so many questions as we learn about Jesus and as we are invited to follow him. Questions like, who are these criminals? What have they done? Who is Jesus forgiving? Who will be in the kingdom of heaven? <laughs> and what does Jesus ask of us as we follow his example today? I'm going to touch on some of those questions. But for me, there's a clear message here of forgiveness. We read about the forgiving words of Jesus, and we read in this passage about the forgiving actions of Jesus. And the first act of forgiveness comes in verse 34 when two criminals or evildoers, as the Greek suggests, were led out to be executed with Jesus at the place called the skull or from the Latin Calvary. Jesus is recorded to say, although not in all early manuscripts, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. It's quite reasonable, I think, for us to ask the question, who is Jesus forgiving here? Perhaps he is forgiving those who are crucifying him, those who are dividing up his clothes by casting lots. Perhaps Jesus is forgiving the soldiers who mocked him and offered him not the finest wine for a king, but rather sour drink, sour drink which is normally for the poor, or for the laborer, or for the common soldier. Or perhaps Jesus is forgiving here all the people who stood watching the scenes, including rulers who sneered at Jesus, scoffed at Jesus, mocked Jesus. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because ultimately, Jesus did not come to forgive one person. He came to forgive the world <laughs> of their sin. And what strikes me about this passage, and it really struck me hard as I, as I read it during the week, is that nobody seemed to capture the Father's heart in Jesus as he said these words. Such beautiful, powerful words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And yet, no one seems to capture the, the heart of the Father in Jesus as he said them. And of course, this is not the only expression of forgiveness, is it, in the passage? The second act of forgiveness came in verse 42, when one criminal said to Jesus, and in contrast to the other criminal, remember me, Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom, or when you come with your kingly power, as some manuscripts put it. Well, what do we know about this criminal? Well, we know very little, don't we, in the passage that we, receive, we read here. It doesn't tell us much about this criminal. But what we do know is that crucifixion in Roman times was a barbaric way to die. It was a form of execution and a form of execution intended for those who are criminals. He and the other criminal were meant to be there. In contrast, of course, to Jesus who was being crucified in between them. Jesus, in contrast, in verses just before the ones we've read today, Luke 23, verse 15, Jesus was examined by Pilate, the Roman governor, and he was found to have done nothing, zero, to deserve death, we read. And then in later verses, verse 47, we read about a Roman centurion or an officer who looks upon this Jesus crucified on the cross and says, this man was certainly innocent. This criminal that spoke to Jesus was in great contrast to the saviour of the world. 
You see, both criminals had sinned. And the penalty for their sin was death. Where is Jesus? He was not at all the disreputable character anyone might have thought he was. He was certainly innocent. And he was dying not because of his own sin or his own criminality. Jesus died for the sin of us all. The sin of that criminal to his left. The sin of that criminal to his right. To all who watched him being executed. And to each one of us today. What we also know is that the criminal who asked to be remembered by Jesus, rather than joining in with the mocking and the insults that the other criminal was was offering to Jesus, this criminal defended him. It's interesting, isn't it? We read in the passage about this criminal rebuking the other criminal. And actually, the word rebuke in Greek actually speaks, yes, of confrontation, And this criminal is confronting the other criminals rebuking um, of confrontation of Jesus or mocking of Jesus. But this criminal is also, as the Greek suggests, is also putting value upon Jesus. We see him speaking of honor or showing honor to Jesus. I think that's fascinating. And this is what this criminal does. He turns to Jesus As though he knows with all of his heart that this man holds his salvation in his hands. That this man, this Jesus, is the one who can offer him everlasting life. Serves as a great contrast to the other criminal, doesn't it? But this scene also raises so many questions for us, doesn't it? And the the struggle for us, I think, might be Jesus' response. In verse 43, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Or as the New Living Translation puts it, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that word paradise comes from the translation of garden in Genesis. What do we do with this? What do we do with this response of Jesus? I mean, this is a criminal. This is a man who deserved to die. He was on the cross being executed for a reason. Surely the kingdom of heaven is not for people like him. For rebels, for brigands, for criminals. Surely the kingdom of heaven is not for for criminals and the the untidy. No, surely the kingdom of heaven is for the neat and the tidy people. People like Billy Graham. Mother Teresa, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Don't take those examples all too literally. (laughs) But the nicely dressed, the ones who speak well, the clean, not the dirty. Surely the kingdom of heaven is for those such as this. It reminds me of Jose Mourinho. Jose Mourinho is a football manager, in case you didn't know, and he currently manages a Turkish football team called Fenerbahce, and he said this week about the Turkish league, here are the words, nobody abroad wants to watch the Turkish league. It's too grey, it's too dark, it smells bad. (laughs) And you can imagine he's in trouble having said all these words. (laughs) But this reminded me of the gospel. I mean, surely the kingdom of heaven is not for those who smell bad. For those who are full of sin and criminality. Surely not. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. (laughs) But yes, it is. Jesus said in Luke 5, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The message paraphrase puts it like this. Jesus heard about it and spoke up. Who needs a doctor? The healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders. An invitation into a changed life, changed inside and out. You see, Jesus came to save the lost. Jesus came to save the sinner. For we have all sinned. 
and fall short of the glory of God, writes Paul. Jesus came to save those who believe and trust in him. Jesus came to save those who turn to him. He came for the salvation of the world. Not just the neat and the tidy. Those who think they are sinless <laughs> and righteous. He came to save the world of its sin. The kingdom of heaven includes criminals and sinners. Even people from Norfolk, can you believe? <laughs> I know, which is good news for me actually, because my parents live in Norfolk, so that's good. People like Shane Taylor. I showed a video two weeks ago of Shane Taylor. He was imprisoned because he'd stabbed a few people. <laughs> and he went on and stabbed more people in prison. But he came to faith and now he's sharing the gospel with people in prisons. Yes, the kingdom of heaven is for such people. It's massively challenging for us. But it's the truth. God made Christ, who never sinned, says Paul, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And what captures my heart in this passage is there's no hesitation in Jesus' response to the criminal. Not that we read anyway. He did not say to this criminal, well, let me think about it for a while and I'll get back to you. He did not say, yes, I will forgive you, but first of all, I want you to go through one by one all the sins and the crimes that you've committed and repent of all of them and then I might consider you <laughs> for paradise. No, there's no hesitation. Jesus forgives him with ease and with haste. Why? Because he loves this criminal. Because he was dying for that criminal's salvation as he died for every single one of us. That's the whole point of this narrative in Luke's gospel, that despite being an innocent man, Despite Jesus dying a criminal's death for all who turn to him, Jesus died that we might all have forgiveness and salvation. He did not affirm the sin or the wrongdoing of this criminal, but he loved him and he forgave him without any hesitation. It's beautiful. I've spoken of the Alpha Course uh, many times before, and... Uh, the Alpha Course offers a number of stories that speak about the forgiveness of God, really powerful stories. We're going to watch one of those stories now, and this concerns a man who was part of the Rwandan genocide. This is the story of Emmanuel. My name is Pastor Emmanuel, and I participated in the 1994 genocide. I murdered Mary Tutsi under the order of our leadership and I spent six years in prison and four years in community service. While in prison, fellow prisoners invited me to try Alpha. I went but struggled to engage. I realized I needed to tell the truth about what I had done and wrote a letter asking for forgiveness of the relatives of those I had murdered. Life was so hard after being released from prison. I found my wife with two children that were not mine and I faced many heartbreaking situations. I didn't know how I was going to live with the genocide survivors after what I had done. My heart was filled with agony loneliness and fear. Encouraged by Alpha in prison, I decided to go Alpha again. I learned that Jesus forgives and experienced love in a way I had never known before. With the help of a local pastor, I went to find Vincent, whose mother and grandmother are killed, to ask for forgiveness. I now live in a village built for genocide survivors and perpetrators. Vincent lives in the same village. We have formed a friendship 
and I now experience peace like I haven't experienced it before. Day-to-day -day life continues to be a challenge, but I have found forgiveness and healing for the things that I have done. Got questions about life? Try out. It's an incredible story, isn't it? Another challenging story. I remember when I first watched that video, I was gobsmacked. I didn't quite know what to think or how to respond. How is it possible that a man who, who killed the relatives of those he now lives with find this forgiveness? It's incredible, isn't it? And surely it's only possible by the transforming power and love of the Father. And it's the same transforming love and forgiveness of the Father is available to us. He forgives those who truly turn to him. And perhaps some of you need to know today that the Father loves you. The Father forgives you for whatever it is you have done wrong. And he wants to meet with you in his great compassion and his love. He not only wants to offer his forgiveness and his love to us, but I believe as we follow Jesus, he also asks that we do as he did, which is to forgive others. And that might seem impossible for some of you today. But I want to encourage you by saying the good news is that he enables us to forgive. You might have heard that incredible story uh, of Corrie Ten Boom. I'm not going to share the whole story with you because I think Jerry did not that long ago. But Corrie Ten Boom, as she was preaching in uh, Germany, well, met a, a soldier who she knew in the concentration camps. And he approached her and he asked her for her forgiveness. And she, she couldn't. She couldn't forgive him. And so she prayed. And when she prayed, somehow the Lord enabled her to take this man by the hand. And she felt the, the compassion and the love of God flowing through her body into his as she was given the power to be able to forgive this man. The same is possible for us. We might be here today struggling to forgive someone or something that has happened in your life, God can enable us, can give us the power to be able to offer that forgiveness. So how do we feel about all this today? <laughs> how is the Lord calling us to respond? Do we need to receive his forgiveness? Do we need to receive the power to forgive? Perhaps we just simply need to accept that he does love us that he does forgive us. We struggle with that acceptance today. Well, I'm going to invite you to do something that we don't really do that often in this church. So I'm going to invite you to be a bit bold this morning. And we're, we're going to start by just closing our eyes uh, just to be respectful towards one another. And as we consider this incredibly powerful moment in the life of Jesus, I want to invite you, if you need to know the Father's forgiveness today, I want to invite you to just boldly stand up where you are. And I'm just going to pray for you. If you want to know the Father's forgiveness today, just stand. <coughs> Father, I want to thank you so much for your great, great love. You are such a good God. And your love for us is so beautifully shown in the gift of your son, Jesus. Thank you for your example, Jesus, and the way in which you were able to offer, without haste, forgiveness to this criminal. And as we stand here today, Father, we offer ourselves before you. Those who know we have done wrong, 
And we ask for your forgiveness. We ask that you would shower us with your love and your compassion. That we would be reassured by the truth that you have set us free. And perhaps some of you uh, want to have the power to forgive someone else today. And if that's you, I invite you to boldly stand where you are as well. And I just want to pray for you. Father, you know us completely. You know what we have done. You know what others have done towards us. And we just bring the situations that are on our hearts and our minds today before you. And we pray for the power to forgive Jesus. Help us to step into your example. Help us to turn to, to others and forgive without haste as you did, Jesus. Thank you that we do none of this on our own but that you give us the strength and the power to forgive. And so, Holy Spirit, anoint us. Anoint us so that we can forgive others, we pray. And for all of us, Father, and if you're standing, you're welcome to sit now. For all of us, Father, I just want to pray that you would give us an acceptance of this gospel truth that Jesus, an innocent man, one who had done no wrong, has died in our place so that we could know the Father's love, so that we could know his forgiveness, so that we could enjoy an eternal life with him. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. Help us to accept these truths today and to follow the example of Jesus as we forgive others. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Andy. We're going to draw our service to a close now with the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Uh, and ask God again for that pardon for sin and a peace that endures. That's his promise to us. So if you can, please stand. Let's sing together.
close the service with some words from our remembrance hymn that you may be familiar with. And it reminds us that when we ask Jesus forgiveness, the bonds that hold us back are truly broken. The hymn says this, I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight and tears no bitterness. Where is death's sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. So Lord Jesus, as we um, go from this place into our week, Thank you that you abide with us. You stay with us in our hearts, accompanying us each day. And that your way is the way of love and of peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take your seats. Thank you for being with us uh, this morning. And we hope you have a really blessed Sunday together.